everyone. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Dan Alden and Senior Pastor of Reality Church here in Perth, Western Australia. And I'm so glad you've joined us to get a hold of this week's message. I really believe God wants to do something fresh and powerful in your life. And I'm praying that this message you're about to hear will be a catalyst for that. So enjoy the message. And remember, Jesus is the reality you've been looking for. We're doing a series called What's My Purpose? And I love what God has been speaking to us about in this series. He's been really been encouraging us. He's been building into us as a church, as individuals, to live for our purpose. What could be greater than to live for what we were made for? What could be more energizing, more exciting than to live for the very thing that we have been made for? And we've been discovering that in our series, What's My Purpose? How many people have been blessed so far, encouraged? If you missed any of the messages, you can jump onto our website at any time and just click on the podcast link and you can get all of the updates there, everything you've missed. And I encourage you, if you missed anything, to get it. Especially last week with Diane. Wasn't that amazing? Encouraging. A little bit challenging, which is good. Which is good. Hey, um, I don't know about you, but I really love the Mission Impossible movies. Anyone, anyone a fan? I've been tracking it for, you know, through the years, trying to keep up. I just love, I love the concept of an impossible mission that there's one guy, there's only one guy that could pull it off. If, if we know this mission is like impossible for all of our agents, but we know one guy who could probably do it. And they always call him, call on him, bring him out of retirement, bring him, bring him out of hiding, bring him out of old age and somehow make him look like he's only 20 something. I don't know how they do it. But I, I like Tom Cruise in, as Ethan Hunt in Mission Impossible. I think he does an awesome job. Uh, you know, I love that scene, you know, when he, when he, I think it's one of the first ones when he drops down in that cylinder type building and he's just got this hook and he flies down and just, just stops at the bottom. You know, perfect precision. I love the, the chases in these movies, um, especially some of the later ones, the, the bike chases. Absolutely epic, the stunts. But when I look at, Tom Cruise playing this part as Ethan Hunt in Mission Impossible. I just get this feeling like, man, this guy was made for this movie, right? Like, I don't know, I've seen him in other movies, but this is, this is the role where he just seems to shine, yeah? Obviously, they turn it into a franchise, there's so many episodes and all that. But it's like he was made for this Mission Impossible deal. I couldn't imagine anybody else doing it as good as him, can you? I couldn't imagine any other actor. Some people are like, yeah, I've got a few that could do better than him. But I don't know about you. When I, when I watch it, I'm like, man, this, this guy is just made for this. He's made for this. And you know what? Today we're going to talk about another type of mission that you are actually made for. And today I want to talk about the fact that you and I were made for a mission. We were made for a mission. Somebody just say that with me on three. One, two, three. Made for a mission. I'm made for a mission, you're made for a mission. Your mission may not appear in a film series, your mission may not be on the news, your mission may not be, you know, covert, but our mission is important and our mission is what we were made for. And so we're going to talk about this being part of our purpose today, that we were made for a mission. You know, when Jesus came to the earth, He actually came for a mission. When Jesus came to the planet. He didn't come just for any old reason. He came for a mission. And in John 17, he tells us about this mission and that it wasn't just for him, but it was actually for us as well. Let's look at it in verse 18. It says, in the same way, this is Jesus speaking, that you, the Father, gave me a mission in the world. I give them, my followers, a mission in the world. So here's Jesus saying, I, I've been sent with a mission from the Father. This is why I was here. And now, in the same way that the Father gave me that mission, Jesus says, I give them the same mission. Are you with me? So the same mission that Jesus had is now the same mission that He's given to us. And we were actually made for that mission. Part of our purpose in life is to fulfill that mission, be a part of that mission, be on that mission every day. Every week, come on somebody, as part of our life, this is part of our purpose in life. You know, this mission was so important to Jesus that five times 
across five different books of the Bible, Jesus made it clear to us that this mission is actually our mission too. Five times the number of grace in the Bible, which means we've been graced for this mission. Are you with me? There's a grace from God for this mission. Five times. I think if Jesus said something five times in five different books of the Bible, he's serious about it, right? We're made for a mission. And so what is this mission that we were made for? Let's, let's look at it in Luke 19 as Jesus describes the mission to us in more detail. In verse 10, he says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. Let's leave it up there for a second. The Son of Man came for this mission. Read it with me. To seek and save those who are lost. Let's just read it one more time. Well, the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. This was Jesus' mission. He said, this is why I've come. This is why I'm here on the earth. This is my purpose, that I would live a life to seek and save, and ultimately through the cross, to make a way for salvation. But Jesus was about saving people even before the cross. He was about rescuing people out of situations of, of sickness, out of despair. He was about getting next to the brokenhearted who had become hopeless and offering them a way out. Jesus was all about seeking and saving people who were lost everywhere that he went. This really summarizes the mission of Jesus, to seek and save. Let's do it one more time. To seek and save those who are lost. And now Jesus has actually passed this same mission on to us. So what's our mission? Is to seek and save those who are lost. That is our mission. That is our mission. You see, Jesus can only continue his mission of seeking and saving lost people if we, his body, choose to accept it. You know, one of the things I love in in the movies, Mission Impossible, is the delivery system of the mission. Yeah, how many people love that? where it's like he goes to a phone booth and, and the phone rings and, and he gets the mission. And, and at the end of it, it says, this mission, if you choose to accept it, right? If you choose to accept it, and then it will self-destruct in like five seconds. I always love that bit, how it somehow just blows up. It's really cool. He, and he gets the, the mission delivered to him in all these different ways. But every time in, in the delivery of the mission, there's this statement, this mission, if you choose to accept it, if you choose to accept it, Ethan. You don't, you're not obligated to this mission. There's a desperation coming saying, we need you, man. Ethan Hunt, you're the only man for this mission, but you've got to choose to accept it. And Jesus says, I've been on this mission, but my time is over. I'm heading back to the Father. I'm going to be seated at the right hand of the Father until I return. But now I'm giving this same mission to you And to me, if you choose to accept it, are you with me, church? This mission, if you choose to accept it, and there's an urgency and a plea, as if he's saying, I I hope you do accept it. Because you know what? Jesus says, "I, I got nobody else. I can't do it because I've already done my part in the mission. Now it's over to you guys. And and there's no there's no one else except my body, my church, yeah, to do the mission. He's not physically here anymore, but we, the church, are the body of Christ. Amen? We are the body of Christ, and it's our mission now. You know, I love Paul, the Apostle Paul, who was Saul, who was violently against the church, whose mission was actually to destroy the church and the work of Jesus and the message of the resurrection. He wanted to destroy it and snuff it out and stop it from spreading any further than it had already spread. But Jesus arrested him on his travels and said, Paul, I know, I saw, I know that you've got your own mission, but I need you to get on board with my mission. Hey, Saul, I know that you've got this plan and for your life, but hey, I actually need you to become all about my mission. I need you, Saul. You're the man. You're the man for the job. And, and I love that by the end of Paul's life, if you don't know the story, his name was changed from Saul to Paul. God likes to change people's names because sometimes our name can carry our past, but God gives us a new name for a new future. Amen? Paul 
if you accept this mission, and by the end of his life, by the end of his life, we see that he had truly accepted it as his own, which is my first point today. Accept his mission as your own. Let's read Acts 20, verse 24. It says, the most important thing, this is Paul speaking, is that I complete my mission. Notice that he used the words, my mission. Somebody say, my mission. My mission, the work that the Lord Jesus gave me to tell people the good news about God's grace. And I love that in the message translation, it says this, what matters most to me is to finish what God started, the job the master Jesus gave me of letting everyone I meet know all about the incredible, extravagant generosity of God. So here's the thing. Paul had accepted this mission from Jesus and made it his own, fully his own. This is my mission now. He's like, I, I will not let Jesus down. This is my mission. And this is, this is the heart that God is calling us to have, that we make it our mission too. So number one today, accept the mission, his mission as your own. That's that's really the first step in this thing is that we accept the mission. We've got the message. We've got the call in. This mission, if you choose to accept it, yeah? And God is calling us to say, yeah, you know what? I'm going I'm to accept this mission. It may not be easy. It may not be comfortable. It might not be in accordance with my, everything that I'm planning and all my agendas. But hey, my life is not my own anymore. It belongs to Him. I choose to accept the mission of Jesus as my own. Are you with me, reality fam? And I love that Jesus hasn't called us to this mission and just left us and sent us alone. He's actually given us a helper for the mission, a sidekick, if you like. How many people know every good mission has a sidekick? Come on. Every good person on a mission has someone on their team, has a team Ethan Hunt couldn't pull off what he pulls off in the movies without an incredible team. Jesus has given you and I a helper. Somebody say the helper. The helper. Let's, let's meet the helper in John 16. Jesus said, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. He's about to finish up on earth. He's getting ready for the cross and, and, and the resurrection and the ascension. And he says, guys, it's better for you. Believe it or not, it's actually better for you that I go back to the Father. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Somebody say the helper. The helper. How many people like help? Sometimes we don't like help. It's not always easy to have help when you need it. But we need help in this mission, right? Are you with me? We need help. We can't do it on our own. Jesus didn't do it on his own. He had the helper too. And he said, I'm going to send you the helper. I'm going to send you the helper for the mission. Let's, let's look at who the helper is. I know some of you already know this, but let's just go to it as though we're discovering for the first time. Is that okay? John 14, verse 26 says, But the helper... The Holy Spirit. All right, so say this after me. The helper is the Holy Spirit. The helper is the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name and he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. All things. This helper has come, has been sent to us to teach us all things, including how to fulfill the mission of Jesus. Amen? including how to fulfill the mission of Jesus. See, we're not, we're not relying on the ways of man. We're not relying on our own strength. We are actually partnering with the helper, the Holy Spirit, to fulfill the mission that God has called us to, the mission of seeking and saving those who are lost. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus gives us a little more about the helper. Let's read it. Acts 1 verse 8. It says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, 
in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So the helper's going to come. He's going to empower followers of Jesus who accept this mission. And what's he empowering us to do? What's he giving us the power, the might, the strength, the ability to do? To be witnesses for Jesus. Not just in back in the day in Judea, Samaria. That's cool. Those guys got that territory covered. But now to the ends of the earth. Are you with me? How many people know that Perth WA is literally the ends of the earth? Like we're the most isolated city in the world. We live on the end of the earth. And so the helper is here in Australia. He's here in Perth. He's here in Wangara. He's here to come upon you, to come upon me, to empower us to be on mission, to fulfill our mission. You receive power. That, that word is huge. We could preach a whole series on that word. It's the Greek word dunamis, when, where we get the word dynamite. This power is not just like confidence. It, it is that, but it's not just that. This is also the power to see sick people healed. This is the power to, like Jesus said, Mark 16, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. This is the power to speak words that you didn't prepare beforehand. As he said to the disciples in that hour, don't worry what you'll say. It'll be the spirit of my father who speaks through you. This is the spirit of God who knows the thoughts and intents of every person in this on the planet and can reveal things about people to us to help us reach them. This is the power of God. Do you know that Jesus did his ministry with the same power of the helper. And he doesn't expect us to do ministry with any less of a form. He, he, he gives us the same power that he had. Isn't that awesome? The power of the Holy Spirit. He gives us power to be witnesses, telling people about me everywhere. So the first thing today was accept his mission as your own. The second thing today is get to know the helper. If we're going to fulfill our mission, we, we've got to get to know the helper. Why? Because we can't do it on our own. I've tried, I've tried reaching people in my own strength before and, and just been a mess. I, I've just messed it up. <laughs> but there's moments that I've been led by the Holy Spirit and it's been powerful. Are you with me? Being able to reach into someone's heart and and see God start to touch their life. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we will be His witnesses. So we've got to get to know the Holy Spirit better. How do we get to know the Holy Spirit better? Well, the Bible says that they will be filled with the Spirit. There's this idea in the, in the New Testament that we receive the Holy Spirit at salvation. He comes to dwell on the inside of us. But then there's another experience called the baptism of the Holy Spirit where we become filled with the Holy Spirit. And then there's, there's evidence that people were not just filled with the Holy Spirit at one time, but actually lived a lifestyle of being filled with the Holy Spirit. And Paul says, you know, be continually filled. There's this, there's this idea that God wants to just kind of keep filling us up all the time. And as we just spend time asking the Holy Spirit to fill us, guess what? He will fill us. <laughs> as, we, as we ask... Jesus said, as we ask the Father, He will give us the Holy Spirit. So how do we get to know the Holy Spirit? We ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We spend time talking to the Holy Spirit. And we spend time praying in the Spirit, praying in other tongues. Tongues is an incredible language that God has given us. It's, weird. it's freaky to people who don't know much about it. It can seem weird. Some people will say that tongues is of the devil and all sorts of things. But if you actually read the Bible, you'll find out that Jesus said, those who follow me and believe in me will speak in other tongues. And we see on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out, they spoke in other tongues. And as we speak in tongues, as we use that prayer language, it gets us acquainted with the Holy Spirit. It gets us in sync with the Holy Spirit. We, we started some training, to, um, some preaching training this week and a small group of people um, that I got together to start teaching about how to preach 
And, um, you know, everyone came in from their Monday and, you know, some people had a crazy day with kids and, you know, sickness and just, uh, you know, all the stuff that can happen and feeling flat. And I'm saying, hey, guys, in a few minutes, you're going to jump on the stage and start preaching with no notes or preparation or anything. And everyone's kind of freaking out. But what we did beforehand is we started praying in the Spirit. And we spent about 10 minutes just praying in tongues and praying in the Spirit. And you know what happened is the power of the Holy Spirit came upon people in that moment and shifted people out of the natural into the Spirit. Though we live in the flesh, we got to walk in the Spirit. Amen? And one of the ways that we get to know the Helper is to pray in the language He's given us, which gets us acquainted with Him in a whole other way. And I want to encourage you to find time to pray in the Spirit. If you're like, what the heck is praying in the Spirit? What is tongues? I've never, I, I don't have that. Then I want to encourage you to jump onto our discovery course, which you can get at the Next Steps Bar. Sign up for it because we have a whole lesson about the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to encourage you to jump on that and, and get into that because that's going to be powerful. So get to know the Helper, yeah? Thank God for the Helper. That we're not in this alone. So Jesus calls us to be His witnesses. I'll give you power to be a witness. A witness. But sometimes we think and we have an expectation that we feel like, well, if I'm going to reach people, I have to be like an attorney for Jesus. Now, how many people know that in a courtroom, there's a huge difference between a witness and an attorney, right? The, the attorney, his job is to, is to have all the evidence have researched and interviewed and gone over the scene and done absolutely everything possible to represent the client. But the witness is called just to come on in and just tell us what happened. Are you with me? What happened on the night of the 21st of June, 1969, whatever it is, what happened? You don't have to research anything. You just got to tell it like it is. The power to be a witness. The power to be a witness, not an attorney. It's not, the, it's not an obligation that you have to be the most amazing arguer of the faith, an apologist, or that you could present all the evidence or prove the truth or press for a verdict and try and force somebody to salvation. It's not about that. It's about being a witness. Come on. The Holy Spirit is upon us to be a witness, to tell our story about Jesus. Here's what happened in my life. See, here's what's going on is that Jesus is actually on trial in the hearts of men and women in our city. They are the judge and the jury. They're going to make a decision about whether they believe Jesus is who he says he is or if he's not. He's on trial. The Holy Spirit is Jesus' defense attorney, all right? Holy Spirit is speaking the truth. He's presenting the evidence. He's working on the, the jury. He's presenting those persuasive statements to point people to Jesus. He's at work in people's lives. Are you with me? Did you believe, do you know that? Holy Spirit's out there working on people right now. But what he's saying is like, I need to call in some witnesses to the chair. Would anybody please stand up and tell the truth about this Jesus who's on trial? Jesus is on trial in the hearts of men and women, and they will make a judgment call. But have they heard from witnesses? Have they heard the full story? Have they heard from someone who's actually met Jesus? Have they heard what it's like to experience His love from somebody who's actually experienced it? That's where we come in. Amen? This is where we come in. We've been invited to tell the story. We read before Jesus said that the Holy Spirit is the helper. That word in the Greek also means advocate. And so the Holy Spirit is advocating for Jesus to people. He, he, you're not the whole picture here. Us being a witness, sometimes we can think, man, I've got to lead someone from no, not knowing Jesus at all. I've got to do all the work and bring them all the way and force them to the altar to uh, give their life to Jesus and then dunk them under the waters of baptism and, you know, no, no, no. You and I are a key witness on the stand. Holy Spirit's already working. He's already working. He gets the glory when the case is won. Yeah, He's at work, but he needs witnesses. You know, in a case, I watched 
I watched a series recently about a, a trial and, you know, these people went to jail, these young kids, it was the, um, the Central Park Five from back in the late 80s. And these kids went to jail and on false testimony, on fabricated testimony. But you know what? All it took was later down the track for one key witness who actually saw something, knew something, had a real testimony to come forward and present their story. And in that moment, it unraveled all that had been built up, all the lies, all of the stuff. And the kids were, who were now men were exonerated. The last one got out of prison. Sometimes all it takes is one key witness to turn the whole case around. And there are people out there in our city who believe all sorts of lies. They're, they're believing fabricated stories about evolution, about other religions, about things that, that, that are just completely steering them away from the truth. But one key witness, one key witness could be the missing link. Are you with me? One key witness. So, so what does it mean to be a witness? We're taking the pressure off saying you don't have to be the lawyer. You don't have to be the attorney. That's not you and me. But we do have a message for this mission. And we are a key witness. And so part of our message is that we share our testimony. Include our testimony, yeah? And, and I want to I just give you a real quick um, a couple of things from... The book that has inspired this series, which is by Rick Warren, it's called A Purpose Driven Life. I want to encourage you, if you want to dig deeper into all the purposes we've been talking about, you can jump into this book. It's an amazing, amazing book. It's written as like a, a daily devotion. So there's one, one chapter for each day for 40 days. It's amazing. But in his book, Rick talks about four ways that we can actually share our testimony. We can divide it into four parts. And so I want to quickly share that with you. If we're going to be a witness... How can I even do that? How do I share my story? How do I share my testimony? So I want you to write this down or take a photo. I actually don't have it on the screen. Just write it down. Put it in your memory. So he says that you can divide your testimony to four parts. First of all, is the first one is what life was like before I met Jesus. What was my life like before I met Jesus? For some of us, that was a long time ago. It's so good to remember. How, how, how was your heart? What was going on inside your world? What was happening around you? What was your situation? Who were you before you met Jesus? Secondly, how, how did you realize that you needed Jesus? So, so how did you come to that moment that you were like, whoa, I actually need Jesus? Like what were the events? What happened? This is your story. And thirdly, how, how I committed my life to Jesus. How did I give my life to Jesus? What, what was going on on that day, on that moment, or that month, or that year when I gave my life to Jesus? That is a significant testimony about the reality of God. That you gave, you, a human being with a will, with a heart, with a mind, you chose to give your life to Jesus. What was going on? And then, and then fourthly, the difference Jesus has made in your life? What difference has he made in your life? We can, we can capture this and, and get familiar with this and we'll be ready to testify at any moment the Holy Spirit calls. When he says, hey, you're taking the stand today. You're taking the witness bench today. I, 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 got, some, I got some people that need to hear the truth. Are you with me? Then we'll be ready. So I want to encourage you to write it down. Start by writing out your story. Get reacquainted with it. Be ready to share it. Don't compare it to someone else's story and think, I don't have much of a story. Your story matters. Your story matters. Amen? First Peter 3, Peter tells us, be ready to speak up and tell anyone who asks why you're living the way you are and always with the uttermost courtesy. So we never present our testimony out of arrogance or trying to force somebody to believe. We're a witness, don't forget. A witness. How many people know a witness? They're not allowed, they're not even allowed to make, you know, claim statements. They just have to get up and tell their side what they saw, what they heard. Here's what happened in my life, man. And you know what's cool about it is that sometimes people can get really defensive when we start presenting truth and we say, hey man, you know what? Listen to me. Like the Bible says this. And you need to listen to me because the Bible says that you're a sinner. And the Bible says that if you don't repent, you're gonna go to hell. How many people think that anyone's gonna hear that? That's amazing. Like, oh, wow. Like, sign me up. 
Most people get defensive. Most people are going to be like, dude, why are you preaching to me, huh? Who do you think you are? But if you say, bro, can I just share my story with you? Do you know what? 20 years ago, man, I was, I was just a young punk. I was, I, was a, I was a lost teenager. I didn't know where I was going in life. I had no sense of purpose and direction. I, I didn't know what I wanted to do in my life. I'd been experimenting with drugs and alcohol. And, you know, I was caught up in this band scene and skateboarding culture. But you know what? Man, I went into a church one day and I heard about God being a loving father. And something shifted in my heart, man. I knew about God all my life. But I just believed he was an old, you know, angry Moses kind of guy out of a story, but with a stick and a huge beard and just waiting to bash me when I did the wrong thing. That's who I thought God was. But I stepped into this place and I heard that he was actually love and that he loved me and he knew me and he made me and he cared about me. And something started to shift. And so I wrestled with it for the next few weeks. And then all of a sudden I heard that Jesus died on the cross for me. And I I realized that I needed to give my life to him. I was compelled and I, I gave my life to Jesus. See, no one can say, no, that's, that's rubbish, man. I've read on the internet that you didn't do that. No, I mean, nobody can argue that. That's my story, all right? I don't, I don't know everything about the Bible, but I am the authority on my own life. And you can't tell me I didn't meet Jesus because I met Jesus. He touched my heart. He changed me. Man, he healed me. I wept and cried in his presence as he healed the wounds of brokenness in my heart and he made me into a different person. And because I had moved from Sydney to Perth and I met Jesus in Perth, one year later I went back to visit my friends who I'd done high school with and when they saw me they said, man, you're glowing, something's different about you, what's going on with you? And I got to share with them, bro, I have met Jesus. That, that's my story. But what's your story? No one can take it away from you. And we got to be ready, Peter says, ready to speak up. Our story has so much power. And you know what? It's not even, it's not even just how, um, like the bigness of your testimony. It's the fact that it is a real testimony about Jesus. And as you speak it, guess what? The helper jumps all over it and starts working it into hearts, starts making people believe. You know, when you tell the truth, there's power in truth. Amen? When we tell the truth about Jesus, something happens in the atmosphere. People listen. People might not listen to our presentation of the five reasons they should believe in Jesus, but they might listen to our story. Amen? And so I want to encourage you to get reacquainted with the story. Write it down. Get it, get it you know, flesh it out. Practice telling it to someone. Make it short, make it sharp, make it to the point. So our message includes our story. And finally today, our message includes the good news. Share your story. Get to know the gospel. You know, some people that have been in church for a long time, if you ask them what the gospel is, they'll say, "Uh, I don't really know. I don't really know how to tell the gospel to someone. Can I suggest that we need to know the gospel for ourselves? Can I put that out there? That if I'm trusting my eternity in a message of salvation, I need to know how to tell someone else that message in my own words. Is that fair to say? And so I believe the responsibility is upon us to get to know the gospel. To get to know the gospel. Paul said it like this, I'm not ashamed of this good news about Christ, for it is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes. Get to know the gospel. So here's just some encouragement for you and I, that we study it. And again, I want to point to Discovery, which is our just entry-level course to Christianity. And Leon did a session in that course called Salvation by Grace, and it's so powerful. And if you want to refresh a course on the gospel in, in this kind of condensed version or not even condensed, but explained and expounded and the, it's just a whole message on the gospel, I want to encourage you to sign up, watch it online. It's free. It will take you about 20 minutes. You can study the gospel in that way and get equipped. Amen. It's powerful. Study the gospel. As you read the scriptures, read the New Testament, read the letters that Paul wrote. They just explain the gospel over and over. 
And then I want to encourage you to practice telling somebody. Practice with a friend. Practice, man, Pastor Luke here, man. He, he'll, be, he'll be ready to take anyone who wants to practice sharing the gospel. All right, so just sign up to see him. Make an appointment if you want. Come and share the gospel with him. We need to get him saved, all right? So <laughs> just practice with someone. I'm, I guarantee it'll set your heart on fire as you share it. It's the words of eternal life as you begin to share about Jesus, as you begin to share about God's redemptive plan, as you understand it to the point where you can explain it to someone, it will empower you. This is, as Paul said, the very power of God at work when we share this gospel from our hearts. I'm telling you, the power of God is at work to save those who would believe. What a joy that we get to be part of the mission. Amen. You know, sometimes we can lack motivation for this mission. But I was reminded by this week, and God constantly reminds me that when my eyes are on eternity, my heart will be filled with urgency. If my eyes are just on the, the temporal and, and what I'm trying to do today and what, what I'm trying to achieve this year, and, and if my eyes are just on my natural world, complacency kicks in. Let's be real. We live in an over-materialized culture. We have more stuff than we know what to do with it. We have bulk rubbish collections of people throwing out couches and beds and we have so much stuff, yeah? Temporal, material, these things are not bad, but if our eyes are fixed on them, they will steal our eyes off eternity. And guess what? The person sitting next to you at work this week, the person on the train, the person that lives next door to you, they are actually eternal. We forget that. But if our eyes are on eternity, I believe we will have a sense of urgency. Do you believe that? How do I get my eyes on eternity? We start praying about someone. Just pray. Pray for someone who doesn't know Jesus. Start thinking about the fact that there is an eternity coming. And that those that don't know Jesus will spend eternity without Jesus. Whatever your interpretation of what you think hell is or isn't, eternity without Jesus is hell enough to motivate me to think, i got to share. i got to be a witness. i got to get this gospel out. I'm not going to do it perfectly. I'm going to stuff it up. I'm going to offend people. All that stuff. People are going to not listen. Yeah, that's okay. But we still have the same mission at the end of the day. Amen. How many people are ready to get on mission? How many people are ready to say, my purpose is to fulfill the mission of Jesus? It's easy to think, yeah, that's, that's that person's mission. And that's the other person. And that's the pastor's job. And that's my leader's job. But today, have I made it clear that it's actually our job? Amen. Is that clear for us today? I hope it is. I know it's challenging. But I don't want to stand before Jesus personally and Him say, I love you so much, Dan, but why, why did you not, why, why weren't you concerned with my mission? Like, why, why didn't you, why didn't you share? Why didn't you do something with the mission? I don't want that for me. Even that is good motivation. <laughs> hey, none of us can do it alone. We need the helper. We need each other. We've got to do it together. Amen. We can reach so many more people together than we can ever reach alone. Well, hey, thanks for joining us on the podcast today. We trust that God is doing something incredible in your life. And if you'd like to find out more about Reality Church or you want to find out more about having a relationship with God, head over to our website, myreality.church, and you can find out everything there. If you're in Perth, we would love to meet you. So come join us at a service on a Sunday. You can find all the details at our website, myreality.church. We hope to see you soon.